Patricia, thank you very much for participating today. Uh, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. Um, we've just had a practice session on how to put this up on the screen, so bear with me and I'll get it up for you now. I am going to stop my own video and it's purely because I will also be getting up and wandering around. I'm more used to um, charging around when speaking and um, sitting down is quite difficult for me. So I'm going to share my screen with you now for the talk and hopefully we can get started. So can you just confirm that you can see that for me, please, James? Uh, I can see your slide view, but we have the slideshow itself hasn't started. Right, so hopefully that will be fine. So, um, right, well, thank you very much for coming to the talks today. I, I hope you take something from them. It is quite a different landscape that we're working in just now um, in this global pandemic. But what has become clear is that we can still meet face to face, um, even if there is just this screen between us. It has brought with it its own challenges um, because I can't see you and normally I would take my cues from your reaction and adapt what I'm saying as a result. It's not easy to pitch the talk without this so bear with me please as I know that one size doesn't fit all but hopefully there'll be something for you and be of interest at least and help at best. So though a lot of us are managing to work remotely, this by no means has reduced the pressure or lets us off the hook. Because what stayed the same and remains exactly the same is the law, the regulations, ethics and GCP. What governed our behaviour before the pandemic still governs it now. I work in TASC, what you can see on the screen there. It's a joint office, which means that I can work closely with my NHS colleagues. We are small in comparison with some academic sponsors. However, we do run an extensive drugs program, the drugs trials program, and currently are sponsoring um, a couple of COVID-19 drug studies, as well as all the others. Um, I myself was on the other side of the table for many years, involved in respiratory research. So like a lot of us, I have extensive experience of CTIMPS drugs trials going back many years. So, my talk today is on boosting compliant rates at universities and where we are now, especially of course the University of Dundee, because this was hit as hard as others when we started getting called to account on our clinical trial reporting of results several years ago. And great progress has been made in this, but we work in an industry where we, we shouldn't be standing still and my talk today is um, probably a step beyond that, which Professor George gave a year or so ago, which is still available on the UK Rio website. At that time, when we were accused across the board of not uploading our results of our clinical trials as required by uh, the Declaration of Helsinki, the accusation actually hit really hard and some institutions responded swiftly, um, whereas others took a little bit more of a relaxed approach. But no institution or sponsor wants this sort of publicity. It, it, sorry, it reduces confidence in us, it gives our industry a bad name, and it reflects on individual researchers. So I was working as governance manager in Aberdeen, up at the University of Aberdeen, when this first became an issue. But prior to that, as I said, I had been working for many years in clinical trials on the other side. So, so this wasn't just a, a sponsor issue. This for me was, was personal. So the Freedom of Information request started coming in and there was a flurry of activity all over the country. You know, could this be right? We all thought we were behaving ethically. We were publishing in peer reviewed journals. We were having statisticians go over the results. And we'd also had several MHRA inspections. But when we gathered the information, it was absolutely correct. It was an issue and we needed to sort it out. Our ethical behaviour was being called into account. Our, our trustworthiness, um, not only the institutions, but specific researchers and CIs. We were all under the spotlight. So this was at a time, and still is at a time, when the world's dealing with misinformation to the public, and a lack of faith in us is hugely detrimental. I'll just move this on here. 
so so how did this happen you know how was it missed research um researchers and governance managers you know nobody just wakes up one day and goes you know i think i'll behave unethically today patricia just i'm sorry to interrupt uh -huh. we can, we're not seeing your slides clearly we're seeing the main uh, your main PowerPoint screen with the slideshow and active we're still on the first slide, I'm afraid. It's still on the first slide, right. Uh, if, if you stop sharing, and did you, if you started the slideshow, and if you stop sharing, hit the slideshow, button. the share screen button again, one of the options coming up will hopefully be your uh, the slideshow as it's running. Have you got, can you see the second? Um, one I now. can see the second slide, but it's not the actual slideshow, so we can see the other. Well, I'm, I might just stay with that then, James, if that's all right, because that's, that's I, absolutely I, I think fine. it might be my computer um, on this one. Um, did, did you manage to get, um, have we, did you manage to see the one about um, the results of um, when we investigated whether we were compliant or not? Did you see this I, slide? I think it would be sent, if you could show the second slide again, that would be great. Yes, please. Okay, so th this was this, this is um, the problem, isn't it, when we're doing this? This is the Thank second you. slide. Um, and um, as I was saying, we were talking about boosting compliance and how my talk will be, um, you know, as, moving on a step from um, Professor George's from last year. Um, and how we were all affected, not least me personally, because I had been involved in drugs trials in the early 2000s. Um, so th this was not just an institutional problem um, to be dismissed out of hand um, as baseless. This was very personal. So, so can you see my third, third slide now? Yes, we can. Thank you. Yay! Yay! And, you know, I hope they're good. I, I feel like I should have actually put some sort of, I don't know, pictures on them. They're starting to look quite dull. Um, so, as I said at the time, there was quite a flurry of activity. We had thought we were behaving ethically. We had, in fact, had numerous MHR inspections. So, I'd been inspected on the researcher side, and I'd been inspected um, as a member of the sponsor um, organisation. Um, so, it came hard when we were accused basically of behaving unethically we, we we're being called to account on our trustworthiness unless you know we cannot in any way have this happen to us can you see i'm sorry i'm going to have to ask each time if you can see the slide i hope that won't be too annoying can you see my rather strange map like one there now sorry yes we can yeah, no, thank you. But um, so the request started coming in and we had to find out, you know, how this had happened because we had thought we were doing everything. We were actually publishing in um, peer reviewed journals. We were having independent statisticians and named statisticians going over the results. Um, so what was it that we were doing? So this was a, actually a slide that I um, created to tell one committee how we in Tayside oversee clinical research. And um, it's a highly complex world. It's covering highly complex activities. Um, and I'm going to apologize now, now that I'm looking at it, because I know that this um, diagram here, it isn't complete. It's not right. It's not you. Um, but surely one glance will show that we're, we are answerable for so many activities and so many areas. So when we're asked to explain why we missed something or didn't do something, it helps. It helps to see the environment that you work in. And we could check and see where this fell because somebody surely had been looking at this. But actually, at the time of the accusation, um, the uploading of results to public registers hadn't been a delegated task and it had actually been missed. So I've moved on to my next slide now. So shout at me if you can't see it. Because this is what we did, and I think this is now almost what everyone has done. Has done. We employed somebody to do this for us, and it worked very well, but we still face problems, the same problems actually as everyone else. So our research registry officer started from nothing, and you really mustn't forget that at a time when this was all going on here, there was no guidance, um, but with the full support of the institution and most of the researchers, we were um, able to get on top of it, um, but it was incredibly hard work. Um, and, I, and I do say most investigators, because in all of this, there remains people, you know, at the back of this, we're talking about individuals. 
And in one case I was involved in, the, the researcher had passed away before the study was completed. Um, this was before the Freedom of Information requests. Um, and we had organised for someone else to come in, review the study, see what stage it was at, and if we could um, complete it. And we did. Um, well, I say we, uh, it was actually the small team of other researchers who wished to honour their colleague, finish the work for him, and offer something to his family. It, it was very much a case of, of look at this. It, it meant something. No one was paid to do this. Everyone contributed out of their own time and um, it was analysed and it was published and it was carried out robustly and as quickly as it could be under the circumstances. The participants were all told um, and we all thought it was a job well done and everyone was very happy. And then they were accused of behaving unethically because the results of that published study weren't on Utrecht. And I can, I can remember when I got that call, the investigator who had helped us uh, was really upset wasn't only upset, he was angry and he really felt like let down because his reputation was now being questioned. So what can you do, you know? Um, at that time there wasn't the staff, there wasn't anyone in place who knew how to do this time-consuming activity of uploading results onto a database which is actually designed to thwart you at every step. So, so eventually someone was delegated, somebody was taken off from another job and they uploaded the results. So what I'm trying to say here, I suppose, is sometimes we don't always appear to be behaving ethically. If someone goes onto the Transparamid site and sees us in Dundee now at 80%, what do they think? And anyone can go on, and, and you know, so they should. But do we still appear to be non-compliant? There isn't, you know, there isn't a box there that we can type in, sorry, the CI is working on the wards, we are short of staff, um, key workers retired. There are reasons why the results are not posted on time. This, this is no way an excuse, you know, please don't get me wrong. It's not an excuse, it is the reality. Currently it's COVID. Most of our prolific researchers are dedicated consultants. A lot of research staff have been seconded to frontline work. A lot of staff have been ill. A lot of staff are not coming back. We will try not to be, but there is a chance that we will not be 100%. So, so we'd recognise this, you know, even before COVID. And we were thinking, how do we get this, this message across about what we're doing, why we're doing it? Um, and though we've no intention of moaning and blaming tools and blaming Utrecht, etc., cetera, um, because we will always try to be 100%, we thought we do need to make sure people fundamentally start to understand academic clinical trials and be involved in them. And this is where patient and public involvement started to come into it. I hope you can see the slide. I, you know, if, um, I'll tell you when I'm changing slides and you can, you can shout abuse at me if you can't see it. So, so PPI started off small and I hope everybody knows what this is um, now because it is huge. In my previous life as a researcher, we always had PPI groups. We, didn't, we just didn't call them that. You know, there were people we asked for feedback and for comments and how we could make it better next time. So, so there's no, it's, this is nothing new, it's, it is just more formal. Um, and it is more formal now. It's gradually moved from the simple reading of participant information sheets to, to much larger contributions. And in Tayside, as elsewhere, it's been happening for a while, but, but always with the research team. On our side, as sponsor and governance, we are asking if there had been involvement and an occasion asking for evidence of this, because sometimes it's not very clear. You know, I've got to be honest, we are getting a patient information sheet that's half written in French and three pages are missing. We know it's not been passed by a lay person in Dundee. So this was never a tick box to us. We always took this, this very, very seriously, this idea of patient and public involvement. So if I can just interject here something about, is, is which studies do we register and on which registers? So we have actually now in Dundee moved to a default position where we require all projects to be registered on the public database. 
can you let me know, can you see the slide which starts which studies and which registers? Uh, this one with UDRAP mandatory for CTIMS, ISR, Perfect. CTF and LMS. Perfect, that's it. So, so I have tried to keep this brief and you'll see that most of my slides are actually very brief because I think sometimes we can muddy the waters of what we do and over um, you know, complicate things. So we require now all projects to be registered on the public database. When they come for risk assessment, we ask that question. We now also have moved on and we require the cost of the registration to be included at grant application, if that's possible. It is a cost that has to be considered now right at the very start. If it's not going to go on a public register, we want a clear reason why, and there can absolutely be justifiable reasons why not, don't get me wrong. But interestingly now, the REC and their responses don't take kindly if a project is not registered. So we're not talking about drug studies anymore, we're talking about any health related project. Um, and last year we were exper experiencing really, really harsh letters coming back from the RECs, different ones and across the country, if we had said that there wasn't a suitable register for studies and therefore we were not insisting on the, the researcher doing this. This was not drug studies, this was the others. So other interventional, other social care, everyone was getting um, questioned. So the chances are, I think, that here in the UK, we are moving to having to do this. So why don't we just do it now? We also do not now routinely approve the use of clinicaltrials.gov. Utract is mandatory for CTIMPS and we use the ISR CTN, the other UK WHO recognised public register for all other studies. Duplication to us is not acceptable and we as sponsor will intervene if the researchers find themselves being told that they must register in both. We are small, so this probably makes it a lot easier for us. We, we are a very small group. But I must emphasise that to date, since this policy was put in place, we've not had to do anything at all on clinicaltrials.gov. What we have had to do is go back and argue our point. So if we're sponsoring a project, then we are underwriting it and we are taking the risk. So the IMP suppliers, the journals and the funders so far have understood. So we are running COVID studies as well, don't forget. So these have not had to be registered on clinicaltrials.gov either. So to my mind, and what I think we're starting to see is that, that clinicaltrials.gov, it became almost like a generic term for registers, a bit like Hoover for vacuum cleaner. And um, when we've gone back and explained the situation, that there is Utrecht, that there is ISRCTN, that these registers comply with all um, of the um, requirements for, for WHO, then nobody has argued with it. Um, but sometimes we are prepared, we, we recognise that, that there might be a case where, where we are not able to do that um, and we're not set in stone. <coughs> Excuse me, we do want these studies to go ahead. So what we have put in place is the process, if this happens, that if somebody is registering on Utrecht and registering on clinicaltrials.gov, then we require it to be a delegated task to an individual. We need to know who that named person is going to be who will upload those results, and we need to know that before we sponsor the study. This is really the only way that we can oversee it. At the moment, though, the only duplication we have is the, um, the UPH studies, you know, the urgent public health, um, because though they're already registered on Utrecht, mandatory because it's drug studies. They are also required to be registered with the ISR CTN purely because they're urgent public health into COVID. So this is a condition of their approval and we're never going to be arguing with that. So they are registered on ISR CTN as well as Utrecht. So that's, their, that's our um, registers that, that we will approve and allow. And um, so, so we're moving on to can you, can you see that now? Is that all right? Hello? Hello? Hi, we can see it. Oh, thank you very much. I'm just um, wondering what was happening there. I think that my own screens have gone a bit black here. If you can just bear with me a second. Not quite sure what's happened here. 
So we, we are, we're trying to move a step forward. As I said, PPI is now um, universal and everybody is expecting to see it. And um, what we're trying to do is not get involved at the stages where the researcher is. Um, so we're not routinely involved in um, the day-to-day, -day, will the study, um, will we look at the patient information sheets, etc. But since we've moved to a default position in, in regard to registering all research protocols, we also require that it must be clear to the PPI group whether the study will be registered or not as part of their um, review. So we're not involved in that, you know, we're not looking at the patient information sheets, etc. but we are adding a different level to this, where we are involved as sponsor. And, and this is actually very early days. So we're not intending to replace the researcher PPI relationship. That's a very different association with a different purpose. What we're moving towards is the greater general knowledge of how clinical trials are risk assessed, approved, managed and overseen in Tayside, not by the research team, but by the institution. So we have no intention of forcing this on anybody um, and it will be a layered approach. If there is a need for this, is there a need for this? Maybe to help rebuff accusations of unethical behaviour or demystify the results? I can't actually remember any freedom of information request that's come through without, with the intention of making us look good. But some of us are, are levelled at us because they don't know the way we work. The lack of public understanding of our industry and how clinical trials are run in academia. A large proportion of the public, we found, they don't know that there's an approval system for even getting sponsorship. They believe that all clinical trials are run by money-grabbing pharmaceutical companies. Equally, there's a lack of understanding about ethics committees and the role they play, or R&D. When we asked um, the public what they thought was the role of the sponsor, they either didn't know or they thought that it was money. So if we as sponsors and universities aren't clear about what we do and how we govern these activities, we're doing ourselves a disservice. And, and let's be honest, we're, we're also missing a trick here. So going back, you know, was there a greater need? Was there a bigger need for understanding? So, so I said that we'd asked people, um, as I hope you do sometimes, what is the understanding that's needed here? And these that you can see on the screen in front, in front of you are the responses from a short survey before COVID-19. So maybe there's a greater understanding now, um, you know, well, I, I'm not that convinced, but no one responding to that survey had heard of Utrecht. Uh, oh, these are responses, by the way, was a short survey that where they filled in their answers on a card and they popped it into a box in the hospital. No one had heard of Utrecht. No one knew what the sponsor was. Everyone had heard of ethics, but not the role it played. No one had heard of clinicaltrials.gov. Everyone agreed with the statement that pharma companies are in charge of drugs um, trials. And nobody, if they answered this question at all, knew what the role of NHS R&D was. So there's a definite lack of understanding about regulatory roles. And to me, this is incredibly damning. So, and it helped lead what we do. So this is, you know, where we are now. We are making ourselves available. This is how we addressed it. We thought they have no idea how we manage these studies. And they think we are faceless people be behind this whole system here and probably working sneakily for pharma. So how do, how do we think about what, what we're going to do with this? So, so we made ourselves available to the PPI groups and the leads and lay people in Tayside. We are building connections with the groups that already exist and um, are responding to queries from members of the public who sit on the various committees. We're working towards greater understanding of the processes and we're trying to be transparent about why we do things and equally why we can't do things. So it's not a case of letting the public in Dundee dictate what we can research or how we do it. It's all about transparency 
answerability. And it goes a long way, I think, to embrace the concept of joint venture, to get rid of this them and us. And it's been education, you know, on, on both sides. We are totally making ourselves available. We're asking the PPI groups if they want to ask us questions, and they do. We're creating an environment where the public can basically, you know, look behind the research and see what protections are out there and how we work on their behalf. We're explaining face to face, email to email, why we require information about data controllers, etc., in, in um, patient fronted documents, even though they don't like it. We have had queries about approvals, not study specific and not from researchers general questions, but we've even had queries on how do we decide it's okay to give a brand new drug to someone? Or how do we decide it's okay to give a drug to someone for something else? So these questions are actually starting to drive our risk assessment for sponsorship. And though I've got to be honest, sometimes I think we're not being asked the right question. You can almost know what it is that they're trying to get out of you. We answer the question that we're posed. So and what we found actually is that it has been embraced. It's not that time consuming. Um, and people seem to like seeing behind these, these no entry signs and staff only areas. And hopefully that this will grow. It is, it's us that are writing the policies that state how we govern our studies, what we expect of our researchers and how we can ensure compliance. And the, the issue of uploading results onto registers is being addressed. Um, and, and all credit, you know, to Till Bruckner and to others for highlighting this, but we can't stop there. We are showing our results and we have published and enabled the scientific community to look at them. But that's not the end because we work for the public. You know, seriously, all of us here, how many of us believe that everyone we know knows exactly where to go to see the results of clinical trials? Do we know anyone personally who knows what Utrecht is or clinicaltrials.gov who doesn't work in the field? If members of the public have been involved in our processes and aware of what we do on our side and the constraints that we work under, then, then there won't be any misleading and they will learn if they want to do, you know. So of course this is really very early days and the, the process is bringing with it its own problems. But yes, you know, small steps here, small steps, and, and hopefully in the right direction. Just go on here. So but really, you know, um, thank you. That's us, the University of Dundee. We had not been uploading our results. We are now. We absolutely took to heart the accusation that we could be considered as behaving unethically and not in the interests of the public. We want the public to partner us, to trust us, and to understand us, and hopefully are making the first steps with this. And I gotta be honest, I, I'm quite looking forward to the time when it's impossible to find a lay person in Dundee as everyone will know as much as we do. And um, we're nowhere near that yet. But if I could stop some things from happening about the uploading of results and public registers, uh, you know, it probably would be that Researchers stop telling me they don't have the time, that they now work for someone else, that they are on long-term leave, but it's not going to happen. And we recognize this. So we do have to have something in place to counteract it. And we do, and we will keep our research registry office, um, officer, beg your pardon. But we also need the public to be more involved. We do. We need them to understand, to tell us you know, how they want these results, in what form, and, and they need to know how, of the environment that we work in. Because we need to build back the confidence. We need to be seen to be behaving ethically and with the best interests of the public at the core of our work. I am a CNC, probably quite passionate about all of this, um, but I'll stop there. Um, I, I hope there's been of something of interest to you. I do kind of, um, I, I do very much uh, bo uh, bob around when I'm talking and um, I've been freaking around a little bit here as well um, and shaking my fist at the screen. So my apologies about that um, and I'm, I'm happy to take any questions.
Yeah. Trisha or Mahapra, and thank you very much. That was a fascinating presentation. It's good to hear the, the the focus on ethics and transparency and doing the right thing, if I can use that aspirational phrase, and going beyond, above and beyond just the the minimum necessary mandated requirements to actually think about sort of ethical conduct in terms of clinical trial practice, registration, reporting in a very in-depth way, layered in with that all-important public involvement. So thank you very much for that. Uh, we've got some a little bit of time for questions. We have a variety of ones coming already. Uh, and what I'll do is if you can keep any questions coming in the Q&A stream, and I'll pick those out, uh, everyone, and put them forward to Patricia. Okay, so I had a question, a number of questions about PPI. One said, you know, PPI is a requirement for publicly funded trials. What about commercially run clinical trials, you know, pharma, biotech, contract research organizations and the like? They often have patient engagement or recruitment part, which is mainly information for patients in investigator sites and social media advertising, not actual patient influence, input or collaboration. Do you have any experiences which you can share about PPI implementation to commercially run clinical trials? Um, I, I've got to be honest and say probably not. The only thing I can say that is that we work, because we're small again, which I have to emphasise, that our commercial side and our non-commercial side work hand in glove. We work together. So we do have PPI representatives in task. There is somebody there in task. So we cannot force commercial companies to do this. We, 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 it can't be a requirement for NHS R&D um, approval, but I strongly believe that if what we need to do is make sure that the public start questioning every study that comes through and get involved. There's different levels of this um, completely, but at the moment, the commercial side is very different from the non-commercial. Um... Thank you. Uh, Mark Taylor has just sent me a note saying that he will cover some aspects of uh, oh, perfect. public involvement commercial trials as well. So the person who made that question will, will be able to talk to you, talk about that a bit later. Uh, some other questions about the practicalities of PPI. Uh, it was asked, how do you engage with PPI? How do you get the information out to lay persons? And another question, how easy have you found it to recruit people for PPI? Well, we have in Scotland, we have SHARE, um, which is, is a massive register of people who have been, who have signed up online or through leaflets around the hospitals, and they have signed up to take part in research, uh, and, and that goes through the health informatics, the safe havens, etc. They can also sign up to do PPI. So we already have a, a huge database of people who want to take part in this, so we can use that in our dental hospital. They're also building up names again for people who want to help us on this side of it for research. So, it's, so we've moved beyond just reading patient information sheets. We've got a brand new website. We've now got a separate page on that. Um, and we also involved the public in, in creating that and having a look at that to see what we were doing. So gradually we're trying to do this hand in glove. So uh, Dundee University has a very, very active um, public involvement group as well. Um, I think we're on the second or third lead of that. But I must say that I personally, I, I personally go out and do this as well. So I have, um, it, it was stopped because of COVID-19, but I was um, joining the groups um, out in the Dundee University who set up their stall, stalls for science days. Um, and I was going to do my puppet show for the, regu um, the regulatory side of research every single opportunity. It, it, it's the people that need to do this. Again, it's not mandated in anybody's um, job description, but you find the group that want to do it and it's word of mouth. Our, one of our biggest concerns is when do they stop being lay people? When do they start becoming as knowledgeable as us? We're, we're nowhere near that, but every single opportunity, every Facebook, every tweet, we started tweeting an awful lot now. Um, and every time the university does something, not everywhere, every, everywhere we could possibly can. That's brilliant, thank you. Is it a literal publish show you're talking about? Because if it is, I think we want to get you back to do that. 
Elizabeth, no, it's not Elizabeth Holmes. It's a proper puppet okay. show. <laughs> right. Okay. We've had. We've had. I've personally, a number of people have said very, <laughs> very positive feedback about the work on public groups involved in clinical trials research. Uh, we had someone ask. Now, this question came in while you were talking about the issue, so they may now feel the question has been answered. But someone asked earlier. Why did you specifically make the move away from clinicaltrials.gov? Now you did cover that a lot in your presentation. I think after the that question was posed, but was there anything further you'd like to add in that regard? Yes, clinicaltrials.gov is a nightmare. U Utract was created using clinicaltrials.gov as a model. So, it, so I hope I'm not stepping on anybody else's toes when, it, when I talk about this. We ask our researchers to complete IRAS forms, Utract forms, um, the, the number of forms that they're DPIA is now, the number of forms is phenomenal. If they then go on to clinicaltrials.gov and upload their results there, what we were finding was that they were being asked to make changes to already sponsored and already ethically approved studies. So we found ourselves in the Saragossa Sea. What do we do when the public register doesn't like your primary outcome and wants it changed? but it's been approved by an ethics committee. And that's that duplication side of it. And I strongly believe that clinicaltrials.gov being free was the one that everybody chose. So unless you are going to have people who are incredibly knowledgeable as the research um, registry officers are, it's not just that problem of uploading the same results. It's not, they ask different questions. So we're trying to cut that off um, and, and as I said at the meeting, we haven't had a problem when, when people have said that, you know, their funder has said that they have to do clinicaltrials.gov or their manufacturer of the IMP. Um, we haven't had that issue, but it could be because we haven't had the volume come through. I, you know, I quite appreciate that. I do. But clinicaltrials.gov is not easy. It's not an easy option. They can register on it. And then they forget about it and they don't realise then that they've actually already broken their ethical opinion. So it's not just a case of registering on it. You have to keep, unlike Utrecht, you have to say you're recruiting when you've stopped recruiting, when you've closed. So this is very much a live um, register. Um, so, so that was why we haven't got the capacity, we haven't got the logistical support to help do all of these. There's the ISR CTN, there's research registry, there's a lot of them out there. Um, and Jacob was fundamental when we discussed all of this and said, no, the one. We can't afford to be fined for not continuing and keeping up registrations on, on an FDA website, basically. Mm -hmm. I hope that answers. <laughs>